Okay, thank you all for coming. I'm Roger McCormack. I'm the Director of Education here at the Bronx County Historical Society. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Lee McColgan, who is the author of a very interesting book on historic preservation, which is really of interest to us here at the Bronx County Historical Society. Um, particularly interesting and it's very detailed and in-depth uh, portrayal of how onerous it is to make sure that these houses are maintained and preserved and indeed restored. Um, our museum is being, of course, the Valentine Varian House, similar in age to the house we're going to talk about tonight and the Edgar Allan Poe Cottage. And the title of the book is A House Restored, the Tragedies and Triumphs of Saving a New England Colony. And uh, I'll let you take it away, Lee. Thank you for coming. Awesome. Thanks, Roger. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for filing into the uh, to our chat here. So I'll start with why I wrote the book. So I I worked in finance for a number of years, and uh, I don't know if anyone on the call works in finance, but generally when you tell people you work in finance, you're you're not necessarily met with cheering and applause. <laughs> um, when I left that industry and got into the world of historic preservation, uh, and this is where I was naive, I thought that I would show up at you know small towns across. New England, the tri-state area, where, wherever I would go, I, I thought that historic homeowners, you know, every, every place you go, everyone would be excited about saving their old architectural treasures and, and see the value uh, in historic preservation. And uh, very quickly realized, as I'm sure everyone on this call is aware, that is not the case. <laughs> um, you have some people that are really strong advocates for historic preservation, and you have lots of people that could care less if these, you know, 100, 200, 300 year old properties get completely demolished and the new new development um, goes in. So as someone that advocates for historic preservation, I, I think that there's cultural heritage that gets lost. I think that these buildings make the towns that we live in more interesting. The thought was, how, well, how can I get people more excited about this? And if we're trying to save old buildings, we can certainly go the way of trying to put more regulation on the books, um, which I'm certainly not against. Uh, the problem with regulation, when you start telling people what they can or cannot do with their property, uh, sometimes people don't like that. Uh, it's, it's my property. I don't want to be told what I can or cannot uh, do with it. Um, so for residential properties specifically, sometimes the historic commissions um, and historic societies be, become the enemy. Uh, and I've I've sat through many a contentious town hall meeting where there, there are battles over what can be done with these properties um, or battles over just just saving, even if it's, it's not a residential, just saving a museum or, or a historic property in, in, in town. Uh, so my thought was, well, if I want to create more advocacy, we can go that way. Or maybe what we do is just tell people a good story and, and get the word out and people might try to win the hearts and minds. I, I think with anything the more we know about something, the more we appreciate it. And and my story is certainly true in that case. Uh, you know, when when you it's one thing to appreciate an old house or the old building fabric, historic windows, old doors, uh, old frames, plaster. It's another thing when you start learning about these materials and learn what went into putting these these structures up. Uh, and then you go even further when you try to copy that uh, and you roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. And at least speaking personally, you come away with a true appreciation for these buildings where, you know, I see someone tearing out old historic windows and throwing them in a dumpster. And, you know, I'm the guy that pulls over the car and loads them up and takes them home and stores them in my barn because I understand what went into making this stuff in the pre-industrial age. And I have this appreciation for it where, you know, throwing this stuff in the dumpster, um, it, to me, it's, it's just wrong. So, you know, the thought is, this this story is the, tr the tragedies and triumphs. There are things that might scare people away from from getting into something like this. Uh, but my hope is that it's, it's part memoir, it's part history. Uh, my hope is that as people read the history and learn what goes into to building a house of this period, there might just be a little bit of that appreciation that I've developed. And, and maybe people will think a little bit differently uh, when it comes to these battles over saving a building or just demolishing. It. So uh, that's why I wrote the book. So there's my there's my my greedy fat cat finance guy. Um, so what so what's the story? So as I said, it's part memoir, part history. Um, the, the story essentially is this: my wife and I bought a three hundred year old house um, 
large, largely untouched. So the woman that lived, she's not with us anymore. A woman named Lydia Hale lived there for 40 years um, before she sold it with us, sold it to us. I always say Lydia was a wonderful preservationist, uh, but which I mean, she did nothing to the house. <laughs> um, so that was part of the appeal for us. We wanted a house that was largely untouched, that hadn't been gutted, uh, that a lot of the building, original building fabric was there. Um, but the downside of that is it was a house that needed uh, that needed a lot of work. And and to make it even more complicated, shortly after we moved in, my wife, Liz, got this wonderful idea. Uh, she always wanted to have a big house that we could host events and, and holidays in. And she said, hey, why don't we host next year's Thanksgiving in this house, uh, which I agreed to which then set the timer on this uh, initial part of this project. I had 18 months essentially to uh, tackle some major restoration work uh, before a couple of dozen guests were going to be showing up on my doorstep. Um, so that that's the story. So when you get into restoring a house of this period, there are obviously lots of different approaches you can take. You can do it yourself, you can take the DIY approach, you can go down to the big box stores, the Lowe's, the Home Depot. You can buy stuff off the shelf. You can hire it out. And then there's a question of, of what kind of contractor do you hire? Um, if you're looking for a preservationist, where, where do you find one? So as I was getting into this, you know, all these questions are whirling around. And, and I'm trying to figure out what's the best way for me to go about this. I want to preserve this character. It's why I bought, bought a house that was largely untouched because I'm drawn to the character. I appreciate how these houses were built in that period. I like the architectural style. So I, so I want to preserve that as best I can. And I don't know if anyone reads, there's an author out on, on the island of Nantucket named Nathaniel Philbrick. Um, he's probably best known for writing a book called In the Heart of the Sea. Uh, Hollywood, Ron, Ron Howard bought the rights to that. And they made a, a big budget Hollywood movie with Killian Murphy. And I think one of the Hemsworths was in that. Uh, anywho, in an earlier book, he wrote about Nantucket and the history, the history of its people. Um, I was thumbing through it, and I come across this account of an 18th century builder by the name of Richard Macy. And it was, it was an account written by his grandson. I was extremely impressed by this. So Macy, when he would build a house, did everything. If he was going to build a stone foundation, he would go to the common land and gather the stones. If he needed lime for plaster or for mortar, he would collect shells and he would burn them. He would fell the trees himself. He would hew the trees. If it wasn't trees of the right dimensions, he would go off the island and procure it and bring it back. He would rot all the hardware. Uh, essentially, it was the, 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 the real jack of all trades. And uh, I read this, and there's a couple of things about Macy. So one, I was impressed. Here's the thing about books. They give us dangerous ideas. <laughs> so for me, the light bulb went off. I said, well, maybe this is the good, maybe this is the right plan for me to restore the 18th century Loring house. Maybe what I'll do is I'll learn all of these trades and I'll try to do all this work myself in the spirit of Richard Macy. The other reason I like bringing Richard Macy to, to the forefront, so I read a lot of histories, uh, a, lot, a lot of different history books and lots of discussion today. It's, it's funny how we reinterpret history as things, social dynamic in our world changes. And it's exciting to see many marginalized groups finally getting some some due attention getting the spotlight one of those groups that i think still gets overlooked is builders um you know usually with these buildings it's the wealthy merchants or the architects that get all the credit it's usually their names on the plaques or if there's you know like a famous writer if you have a poe or a famous writer that lived in the house um you know, seven gables house nathaniel hawthorne the lisa may alcott house little women these are the people that these houses get named after and usually the people that built them, that stacked the stones, that cut the timber, they're long forgotten. And when you read these history books, rarely do you ever hear a name. It's always the blacksmith, the joiner, the carpenter. And I found this wonderful account of this 18th century builder uh, that gave you a little bit of his, of his life story um, and his name. And so there was a little part of me that in telling my story also wanted to give Macy some of, some of the, I think, due credit. Um, for, for the work that he did that, again, largely gets the builder's kit. Uh, so that's that's the, the springboard point of the story. So I'll, I'll just share one of the chapter stories, and then I'll make a few closing comments, and then um, 
Roger's muted, but I don't know if we want to do, if we want to do questions, I'm more than glad to do that too. So this was the kitchen when we bought it. So it's a, the house is very Georgian in its style. It's a Georgian colonial, very Georgian in style. Um, two end chimneys. It started out as a single story and then an addition was added. Um, and the elevations expanded as we often see with these old houses. They're, I, I say, stitched together like, like a patchwork quilt. Um, <laughs> if you want to use a maybe more appropriate analogy, stitched together like Frankenstein's monster, depending on how you want to view it. Uh, but this was the L, this was an addition off the main house built. This was built, my best guess, I didn't do the dendrochronology, but probably early 19th century, this part of the house. And as you can see, covered over in lots of paneling and linoleum and most of the architectural updates stopped in the 60s or 70s and 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 had, it had frozen in time there. So I thought, well, I'll start here. I figured it would mostly be cosmetic. I'll tear off all this paneling. You know, maybe I'll find some nice horsehair plaster underneath this thing. I'll, I'll tear up this linoleum, maybe find some nice original wood floorboards, and I can restore this part of, of the structure you know, back to its early 19th century uh, uh, glory. So I grabbed my three foot long crowbar. And I, and I should say there was one corner, usually on a timber frame, the, the framing is exposed, um, as you can see. There's one corner where the framing is also covered in this dubious layer of that you know, very, uh, um, you know, often seen veneer brown paneling that we love to use in the, in the 60s and 70s, and even into the 80s. Um, there was one section of the frame that was also covered in paneling. And I probably should have thought a little bit more about that uh, when we bought the house, but I didn't. So I get my crowbar and I wedge it in between the seam of these panels. And I'm prying away. And I don't know if anyone's removed this paneling before. It's veneer and it's cracking and popping and the dust is coming up and the nails are coming off and I'm excited. What am I going to find underneath this thing? What, what kind of you know, mysteries are underneath this thing? And I pry and pry and pry. And I get this whole panel, section of panel that comes off intact. I set it aside and I look at the corner of the frame and what do I find? But nothing. <laughs> uh, I find this is a little further down in the process. Uh, but I find a gaping hole where the corner of this timber frame should be. So this is one of the more complex areas in the framing. And I don't know if there are any timber frame experts um, on the call here. Uh, but historians like to call the corner of a timber frame building of this period, if it's an English built house, of course. Um, New York, you have a lot of Dutch. You have Anglo-Dutch houses there, too, kind of a mishmash of different styles. You see that more often. This is an English built, built house. And they like to call this assembly in the corner the English tying joint. Uh, and this is a picture of the English tying joint. Uh, and for anyone that knows framing, you can see these posts. They're really thick on the top and then they taper down. Uh, some people call them a gunstock post. Uh, the English call this, they call that a jowl post. But the reason, as you can see from this illustration, that you need this extra material, it's because everything is tied together with mortise and tenon joinery. I would say the the mortise is like this, it's like a plug in a socket. So the tenon is the plug um, and, the, and the, the mortise is the socket and this stuff plugs together and then the hole is drilled through and, and it's pegged together and therefore these things will stay up without nails. Um, if you look at the top of that post, you'll see there are two tenons, run, one running in the direction of the eave end, one the number six in this illustration called the teasel tenon, uh, running along the, the uh, uh, direction of the gable end. Um, so this essentially is the convergence of four points, the post, the wall plate, the tie beam, and the rafter. And they all come together with this elaborate mortise and tenon joinery. And oh, by the way, there's a really intricate dovetail cut in the bottom of the tie, be tie beam that sits in a recess in the wall plate, tying this thing all together. So that's the English tying joint. So for timber framing, it's one of the more elaborate um, bits of, of joinery that you're going to find. Now, as a novice timber framer, as I was at the time, um, I'm a proficient timber framer. I wouldn't call myself a master timber framer, um, but proficient timber framer now, novice timber framer then. Staring at the corner in your kitchen and seeing the English tying joint is completely gone is pretty alarming. And I'm wondering how this house is not falling down on my very head. And this really was one of those moments 
where I threw my crowbar down. It clangs on the floor. I go running out to the barn. I'm rummaging through scrap wood. I find a couple four by fours. I come running back in the house with these things under my arm with a saw and I'm you know hacking away. And I'm trying to prop four by fours under this frame, wondering how the whole thing isn't coming down. Um, I'll go back to this illustration. What I learned is those vertical sheathing boards you see there, they're a lot more structural than you might imagine. Uh, so an entire corner of your frame um, can rot away and the sheathing boards will actually hold the thing up. Uh, so that's the thing. You know, sometimes these repair these these things aren't as bad as people. You know, sometimes people call me and they, oh, I've got some bug holes in my in my frame. Oh goodness, this is horrible. Um, and I'll I'll go out and look at the stuff and say, oh, don't worry, I, I've I've seen a lot worse. Um, so yes, the whole corner of your timber frame can rot away, uh, and the structure is not necessarily going to come crashing down on your head. Uh, but still, a scary prospect. So. At this point, I charged into this project. This is very typical of my personality. I charged into this thing very confident. Oh, 18 months can do that. Richard Macy doing everything himself. I can learn it. I can figure it out. This is me. Um, and I, my, my uh, modus operandi is I quickly get myself into these kinds of messes and then have to weasel my way back out. And this is one of those cases. This whole story is, is a case of that. Um, but quick, quickly realized, okay, maybe I need a little bit of help uh, maybe I need to learn a little bit more about timber framing than just from the tinkering I've done or what I've read in some books. So there was this question, if one wants to find a modern day timber framer, and I'm still stuck on doing it, everything in kind, doing it the way that, that it would have been done by a builder like Richard Macy, never never found any documentation of who actually built this half the house, the Loring house that I lived in. Um, again, the credit goes to Thomas Loring who had the house built. I have no idea who the builders were. But in keeping with that spirit, I set out to find a modern day timber framer. And again, I don't know if anyone this, in this call is a timber framer or has worked with timber framers or, or the Historic Society works with timber framers. I don't know how far you get into the weeds when you do restoration um, or what, what the age of your properties is. Um, but I initially didn't know where to find one. It's not, you, know, you don't generally open up the phone book and, and, and or go online, you go to the online yellow pages and, and find a timber framer. Um, so I had remembered as a kid there's a museum nearby where our house is on the South Shore in Massachusetts called Plymouth Plantation. And I don't know if anyone has ever made the trip to Massachusetts to Plymouth to see Plymouth Plantation. Uh, essentially, it's a large living history museum uh, dedicated to the Puritans that uh, and the Native American, the, the, the settlement that was founded in 1620. And if you grow up in this area, um, just about every school gets taken on a field trip where you go down to Plymouth Plantation and you learn about how the Native Americans made dugout canoes and you learn about how the Puritans made these framed houses and you learn a little bit about history of the first Thanksgiving. Um, so I had remembered seeing all these early you know, pilgrim homes and thought, well, that's probably a good place to start. So I hop in my car and I drive down to Plymouth Plantation go into this living history museum. And again, I don't know if anyone has, has ever been there, but what I'll tell you is, at least when I went there, uh, the employees there are all in, in their inter historic interpreters. So I've got these people that are given a character and they're given a character of one of the passengers on the Mayflower. So here I am in the 21st century, trying to have a conversation uh, about the framing and about these structures that are on this property. And I'm being greeted by costumed interpreters that are are playing a character, interpreting a character of one of the passengers on the Mayflower. And I can't get anyone to break a character. So I'm going from person to person and I'm trying to have a conversation about how these buildings were built. I can't get anyone to talk to me. I'm getting, you know, butter churning and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so finally, there's a woman. She sees my frustration. She's got, you know, the big felt hat on and the linen dress and all that. And she sees my frustration and she pulls me aside and she's looking over her shoulder. I, mean, I don't know what they do to these folks. If they break character, but there seems to be pretty strict protocol not to. And she's looking over her shoulder, making sure no one's watching. And she does the unthinkable. She breaks character and she leans in with whisper. She says, person you need to talk to. It's a man named Michael Burry. He built a lot of these houses. He knows everything. So I get the information that I need. So I leave Plymouth Plantation 
I tracked this gentleman down. This is him in the hard hat, the lighter colored shirt standing on top of this timber frame. He is the was then and still is the preservation carpentry instructor at the North Bennett Street School in Boston. It's the oldest trade school in the country. And I track him down and I go out to one of his projects. Uh, he's working on, a, on a, an old mill that he's restoring. And I talk to him about what I've gotten into. And it turns out that Michael is known for taking on an apprentice in between the summers to um, help him do these, to tackle his summer timber framing projects. And he hadn't, ha he hadn't found an apprentice yet. So I raise my hand and say, I'll do it. Now, as you could imagine, leaving a nice stable career in the financial service industry to go be the apprentice for the eccentric timber framer is not the most lucrative career decision one can make. Um, but I was, I was, had, it was, had gone deep down the rabbit hole at this point and was very excited about this prospect. So walk away from this corporate career uh, to go spend the summer working with Michael Burr, the timber framer. And it was, I wouldn't try, I have no regrets on any of this, as crazy as it sounds. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade any of this. Um, so I learned some of it was, you know, in, tr in true style of an apprenticeship. Some of it I learned, you know, how to cut a mortise and, and tenon joint. Some of it was just cleaning up, cleaning up the shop or helping Michael mill boards or doing whatever needed to get, get done. Lots of, lots of grunt work in exchange for little tidbits of, of knowledge. So the summer finishes and I head back to my house and I'm ready to start repairing my frame. Now, the one thing I didn't do was hew a beam. And the words of Richard Macy are echoing in my head. I really want to hew a, I had original ideas of felling a tree and then hewing a beam. And with the 18 month, time frame decided that might be going a little too far uh, but I did still want to hew a beam because there are these wonderful scalloped indentations left from the heat from the broad axe um, that you can see and to me it's these little details that give a house this period the character that I love so much so I have found a sawmill had them cut a beam I had them cut it square so I had a squared beam but I had it cut it had, had them cut it larger than the size that I needed so I could hew the face of it to give it that nice textured scallop finish. So I hadn't learned this. I'm going off this picture. There's a, a gentleman by the name of Eric Sloan. Now, there's an Eric Sloan Museum in Kent, Connecticut. I don't know if anyone has been to that, but he wrote a lot of books about kind of romanticizing, very romanticized versions of, of early colonial America. But these wonderful illustrated books, I think he wrote those in the 50s or 60s. Um, and anyway, this is a, a, a screenshot from one of those of someone hewing a beam. So it's a two-part process. On the top, you cut a series of notches to sever the long cellulose fibers in the wood, which is gonna minimize tear out when you hop down off the log and take the larger broad ax and kind of hew the, the rounded end flat. And that's what gives it those nice scalloped indentations. They used a double, double beveled hewing ax in the 18th century. So I get this big cut beam and I prop it up. And I climb up on top of the thing with the felling axe and I'm gonna make, I'm, I'm doing what you're seeing in the illustration on the top and I'm gonna score these and make these scoring cuts. Juggling it's called, J-O-G-G-L-I-N-G. -G -G. And I get up on this thing and I'm looking down and I'm realizing I'm about to start swinging a felling axe in between my feet, which is not the safest thing that one can do. And I'm standing up on this thing and I'm looking down and I'm thinking, man, I must have lost my mind. And I've got all these, you know, grim, grim visions are dancing through my head of lopping off a toe and having to climb off of this thing and, you know, stumble around on the grass looking for a missing digit, call, call the paramedics. And I'm starting to sweat a little bit. But you get to that moment in life where you've got to commit. So I raise the ax up. Like I'm cutting off the head, like I'm a medieval executioner cutting off a head. And I bring it down and my first cut misses, it skips off the, the wood. Um, but I don't cut off a toe. It's in, my body is intact. And I give it another go. And over time, I start to get the mechanics. It's just like swinging a golf club. You just start to get the natural mechanics. And I start working my way down this beam. And I cut all these nice notches. And I take my hewing axe. And I cut this thing flat, just rotate the thing around, just start working my way down. And then I study the joinery and I figure out how to cut the joinery with some simple tools. And by the end of it, here is my gun stock or jowl post with a nice hued finish and the nice joinery that is fit for my English tying joint. I call off a couple friends. They help me push this thing up into place. 
And then I make a series of what are called scarf joints. This is a better picture of the scarf joints. So essentially, I don't have to cut away the entire beam. I can just remove all the rot. And then I can cut a scarf joint. It overlaps like a finger joint. Uh, this is called a bladed scarf joint. Uh, they have all sorts of fun names. An edge half scarf joint with a bridled abutment is a fun one. There are books that have all this stuff in them. Um, you can see a little bit of the top of my dovetail on the far right of that English tying joint, the tie beam sitting down into the wall plate. So I cut the scarf joints. It's a series of kind of fitting these pieces in and they fit tight, take popping them back out, shaping a little down here, a little down there until before you know it, it all goes back together. And that is the fashion in which I restored my English tying joint. So I hastily put this room uh, back together and do some do a little bit of a cos some cosmetic work on it. And then I go into the bathroom and I remember this, I'm going to wash wash my some dirt and stuff off my face and I'm washing my hands and I'm looking in the mirror. And if anyone knows, when you lean into a mirror, the reflection behind you gets, you see more of the room behind you, just our, our perspective. And I remember I'm leaning in to make sure I got everything off my face and I see behind me on the ceiling, a black spot that I had not seen before when we first bought the house. My first thought was, what the hell is that? And that is the end of chapter one. So that is the, that's what the story is. So it's a story of, it's again, part memoir, part history. It's about this, this, this house built by a man named Thomas Loring in Pembroke, uh, but it's not about Pembroke uh, and it's not about Thomas Loring. It really is a story of the materials uh, identified six materials that were used to build a house in the 18th century, wood, lime, iron, stone, glass, and brick. Uh, and it's my, it's my uh, story following the path of this builder, Richard Macy, fumbling around trying to learn how to use these materials and, and how to fashion them with the tools that would have been used in the 18th century uh, to do largely structural uh, repair work on this house in an 18 month time window before a couple dozen guests uh, are going to be showing up uh, on, on my doorstep. So every chapter follows the same structure. You know, then I get into the plaster. Uh, it's I get into get in over my head. I go find an eccentric contractor that's still working with traditional plaster. I learn from them. There, I go down a little rabbit hole where I give you a, a, a traditional history of plaster work in that time period. And then I, I go back, do my repair. And just when all looks well, something goes wrong with one of the other materials. So the biggest thing you'll find uh, with these materials, a few more comments, Roger, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, the biggest thing you'll find, all of these materials are, uh, I would say they're minimally processed. So they're processed, but uh, generally with simple hand tools or you know, plaster might be heated at low temperature, wood, wood fired. Um, most of these materials have not changed that much from how nature, how they evolved in the natural world for thousands of years. And what you get is materials that are very porous, uh, meaning these houses are permeable. And we hear this with old buildings, they need to breathe. What that means is when it rains or if you get moisture coming up from your damp basement, these materials are gonna absorb that moisture. But when, you, when the sun comes back out or when you open a window and air the place out, these things are gonna dry out. And if you have good materials, good old growth lumber, good stone, good mortar, um, and the moisture doesn't get trapped, uh, these houses can last for centuries. The oldest standing timber frame structure in the world is in Tibet. It's built in the seventh century. Uh, now we build houses very differently today. We use, if it's a wood framed house, we're generally using new growth pine. It's a soft wood. Uh, it doesn't grow very densely. Um, we nail this stuff together. We wrap everything tight with polyurethane-based products, ice and water shield, um, house wrap, and uh, which claims to have some permeability. But general, what, generally what we're doing is we're trying to create moisture barriers. We're, we're using latex paints and we're laying plastic down before we pour the concrete slab in the basement. And we're trying to create a complete moisture barrier. And there's nothing wrong with that either. I have no qualms with how we build houses today. Um, that, that generally it's more comfortable living in a house that way. The problem that I see when you get into the world of historic preservation is when you start mixing these two 
methods and materials. So oftentimes I'll see modern builders are brought in to work on historic houses and they're using modern methods and they're creating moisture barriers around materials that um, need that need to breathe, they need that permeability. And sometimes, you know, there doesn't create any problems, um, but sometimes it does. Sometimes what ends up happening is you wrap these things up tight, uh, but moisture still finds its way in and now you've, you, it doesn't have a way out anymore and now you've trapped it and that can accelerate deterioration and rot. One of the examples I see a lot is with traditional mortar. So old brick is very soft to begin with because it was fired in low fired wood kilns. And if it's been sitting outside for a few hundred years, it's deteriorated even further. Uh, but the old mortar is made of lime plaster, which comes from essentially burning limestone or seashells and breaking it down into a putty. That is very soft too, softer than the brick. And that's by design. You want the mortar doing two things. If your brick structure is settling, you want the mortar to fail first, not the brick, because that can always be repointed. And when these structures soak up water, you want the water to have an exit point. You want it evaporating back out through the mortar. You want it wicking. You don't want it tr getting trapped in the brick. What happens a lot of time is masons come along and they repoint these old brick structures and they're not using a soft traditional lime mortar. They're using a modern day, very hard, very dense Portland cement. It's harder than the brick itself. It's harder than the moisture than the mortar. And what you're doing is one plugging up one of the pathways that water can escape. Um, and and two, when we get heavy rains, the brick now is soaking up the moisture and without the, the same exit path, it gets trapped. And if that's happening in the changing of the seasons where we have freeze thaw cycles, it gets trapped in the brick, the ice expands, and that's what you see your, your brick or your soft sandstone or whatever it might be uh, starts to spawn. Um, so more and more, you know, this, this thread of knowledge has been kind of retied. A lot of this tradition went away in the 20th century, and there have been a big wave of, of preservationists like myself that are relearning this, these old forgotten arts and are passing that information along. And more and more contractors, I think, are, are, are understanding that an old house and a new house are different, um, and they should be approached in a different way. Uh, but again, part of why I've, I've written this is to expand that knowledge. Um, to, you know, uh, you know, again, avoid some of the disasters I've seen where these two methods get get mixed. So I'll come full circle and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. And Roger, I know if we have time for questions, but I'll come full circle to um, one. This, so this is a good example of why I wrote the book. And the more people know about this, um, you know, the, the, the more that we can approach restoration projects. Uh, in a way that, that might be more uh, prudent as stewards of these historic buildings. Uh, but I'll come full circle. My goal is to create more advocacy through historic preservation uh, by telling a good story. Uh, so we've had, a, we're getting a lot of traction. Um, we had a, a feature in, ran in the New York Times, which is very exciting. Uh, we had an article in the Boston Globe. Uh, I'm under contract for an article in Yankee Magazine. Uh, we had an article in the South, uh, smaller South Shore magazine uh, in Massachusetts, and I'm traveling all over the place doing as many in-person presentations, doing as many um, of these kind of Zoom or Teams calls that I possibly can, um, getting the word out the best that I can. Uh, the hope is that we can get people excited about this. Uh, what I need is help, and the best way you can help me uh, is buy the book. Uh, I always joke, this is my pitch, I always joke, if you don't like it, you know, take take those pages. They're nice and dry. Tear them out. Crumple them up. It'll be great to get your next fire started over your nice historic hearth. If you do like it, share it with a friend or someone you think that might be interested in the topic uh, and help me get the word out. The more it's like anything, the more people that, that are interested in this. Uh, we have fewer of these contentious battles at these local town hall meetings or city hall meetings. Um, the more people that are interested in this, the more public attention we get. Uh, it's easier to get funding for projects. And the more funding we get, the more properties we can save. So to me, as someone that works in the trade, it's not just selfish interests as someone that works in, in the trade. For anyone that thinks that these historic buildings make our towns more interesting, preserve our cultural heritage, uh, you know, make our communities a little more rich with, with history, um, which I'm guessing anyone that's dialed into these calls is probably thinking about it the same way that Roger and I are. Um, you know, help help me spread the word. So that that's that's the best thing that I can say. 
So with that, Roger, I'm going to stop talking. And I don't know, I can talk more. I The other thing is, if you have specific questions about your own prop, people will come up to me after these things. And of course, they want to talk about their own projects. More than glad to hear what you're working on. If you have specific questions you. for your project, more, more than glad to answer that the best I can. But I'll, yeah, really, I'll, I'll there. Is that good enough, Roger? Oh, yeah, really, really good talk. I have, I have a few questions, and then we'll turn it over to um, uh, the people who have joined us virtually. And I've, I've put the link to the book in the chat, so please uh, buy a copy. Um, you start the book with this very interesting anecdote about these Buddhist monks that you saw, Tibetan monks in Omaha, Nebraska, building these very intricate um aesthetically, you know, very arduously made uh, sand sculptures called uh, mandalas or mandala, mandalas. Yeah. I think it's, and, I think it's you, mandala. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert there. I'm an old house <laughs> expert. But. No, neither am I. <laughs> um, and then at the end, when they had finished, they would throw them or pour them into the river nearby. And you yeah. kind of use this as kind of this informing principle in the book that historic houses are, you're preserving them, but there's always this fear that Nothing lasts forever, and there's kind of these inexorable changes. But talk more about how you, um, what that what that anecdote means to you, and how it informed the the overarching uh, argument of the book. I, so I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I have a slide. <laughs> um, sometimes I close out my talks with this. Sometimes I if I'm running long, I, I don't get into it. It's it, it gets a little more philosophical if some people just come because they want to hear more you know, practical nuts and bolts about you know how how these how to fix an old house. Um, but I do like to get philosophical from time to time. So I'm glad you brought that up. So this this is what the sand structure, what, what the sand sculpture looks like. So I had just stumbled I, when I was working in finance. I was, it was um, a sales rep traveling in the Midwest and of all places for a New England, uh, New Englander that likes to build stuff to end up. You never know where life's going to take you. But I had stumbled into this demonstration where these monks were making one of these sand sculptures. Essentially, what they do is they draw this geometric pattern out on a flat board. Um, you can see a little bit of the drawing in white, and then they hunch over it with these with these little vials of colored sand and these little funnels, and they very slowly tap the funnels to distribute the sand very delicately until it makes this really intricate, elaborate pattern. Um, and I don't know how long it takes them, to, and certainly more than days. I don't know if it's weeks, but it takes them a while to to make this thing. And then when they're done, they they just sweep it up and they dump it in the river, and it's this kind of never ending reminder there's a couple things philosophically again i'm not a religious expert so if anyone knows more about this chime in but my understanding it's it's a couple there it does a couple things one it's it's kind of helping us understand that there is an impermanence to all things in the world um whether we like it or not and and the second part of it is when we're really attached to something it makes it harder for us to lose it um so when you kind of when you put all this work and time into something and then you just get comfortable sweeping it away and dumping it in a river it it helps you train your mind to to not have that sense of, of attachment. That's my understanding of it. Um, so it's philosophically interesting to me because, and I opened the book up with the story because in the middle of this restoration, I went all in on preservation. I left my career, I get into it, I buy the old house. I'm working for other people's clients and then later my own clients all day. I'm going home, I'm doing my own projects on my own house all night into the weekends. For, for seven years or so, I literally it was preservation work, not around the clock, nonstop, uh, fully immersed in this. And somewhere in the middle of that, I had this thought of kind of that, why, why that, why am I? I'm going, you know, jumping through these hoops to hew the finish and, and, and these little intricate details. Um, you know, why, why am I doing this? Why am I taking this kind of unorthodox approach to restoring this house, making my own life probably more difficult, just going down to Lowe's and kind of slapping this thing back together. Um, but, you know, what's the point of this when, when you look at kind of a contradicting philosophy where on a long enough timeline, you do accept that nothing's permanent. On a long enough timeline, the house is going to be gone. Uh, but to me, my philosophy is, is different is different than the monks. Or, you know, maybe you could say, I don't, I'm sure their philosophy when it comes to their temples isn't to just let those things get demolished and put up a, a parking lot. Um, so there's probably some alignment when it comes to the temples, but um, I haven't had any detailed conversation with the Buddhist monk about it. But anyway, my my philosophy is is at least different than what is being communicated with the with the art of the mandala sculpture, in that 
I do. I did get attached to the house. I am. I am attached to that house. Um, it's a very special place for me. It's you know the family gatherings we've had there. It's such a unique setting. Uh, you know, some of my own memories, what's formed my life story, have happened on this property. Which as more time passes, it makes it more and more um, of a special place. It's not only telling this history of building or the history of the people that lived there before. Um, it's really now. Now it's now my own personal story. Uh, is it is attached to this place and i don't think that's unhealthy i do have an attachment to this property i would be sad if it if it got um bulldozed and and i and i don't i don't think there's anything wrong with that um if we want to get philosophical i think the things that we own there's another quote um this came from a woman whose house burned down and she she kind of wrote this little essay on it um it's a professor at a college i think in colorado named karen lawler she wrote, my house is not just a thing. It's an extension of my physical body, my sense of self that reflects who I was, am, and want to be, uh, which I thought was interesting. Again, getting a little more philosophical here, but the things we own are reflections of who we are and, and, and who we want to be. Um, and that extends to you know, our communities. And if you drive around your community and you look at the structures and the buildings and the green space and the parks and what's there, it's their reflections of the people that live in the communities and their values. And there is a question of what, what do you appreciate? And, and, and what do you want your, the, the, these things to say about you? How, how are they? Reflection? Um, for me, you know, I think these old houses, I, I like history. Uh, I think they make our towns more, more interesting. Um, there, I go into the details of how these houses were built aesthetically that the, they use geometry to, to align doors and windows and, and arrange the fenestration. There's a real old way of building that largely got lost in the 20th century. I'm someone that, that appreciates that. And I think that the house is that when I build things, I want them to last. Um, and that house is in a way, it's a, re, it's a reflection of how I think. Sorry, that's a long winded answer, but there you go. Oh, no, no, very interesting. Um, so I'm always interested, cause, particularly because we have obviously two museums, um, the Valentine Varian House, which was built in 1758 by Isaac Valentine, who was a, a blacksmith and a farmer. Um, and the Edgar Allan Poe Cottage, which was built in 1812, um, and which is a classic Dutch clapboard farmhouse built originally for farm laborers. There's all these kind of lacuna in the, what we really know about certain things. I mean, we know, for example, that Isaac Valentine owned slaves and that slave labor in part was used to build the house. Um, the Poe Cottage was built in 1812, but the architect, John Wheeler, He's really kind of a mystery to history. I don't really know anything about him other than that he was the architect that built the house that Bo lived in. Um, yeah. but you said you didn't know who built this house, but you know it was built in 1702 and that Thomas Loring was the, he had it built and was the first owner. Um, what, what could you extrapolate from other houses like this at that time? Like who was likely to have built it? Um, what what were the occupations of Thomas Loring and what what kind of I think the architectural style is Georgian, but say more about what what the house kind of reflected of its owner at the time it was built. Yeah, so there's a, there's an account in the book, um, and I, and I'm getting this from he's he's passed away now, but there's a uh, there was a very well known um, historian, more well known in in Massachusetts here, but uh, than New York, but. Um, a very well-known historian named Abbott Lowell Cummings, and he he wrote a lot of stuff in the 60s, 70s, and even to the 80s. Um, he passed away not that long, long ago. He lived, he lived to be in his 90s and had a good run. Um, but I, you know, like many people, I was under the impression that, you know, we have this idea that every farmer was also a carpenter. Um, you know, that that these they that everyone was this kind of Richard Macy, this jack of all trades. And um what Abbott Lowell Cummings did, which I'm glad that he did, because it's, it's that's not it's not right, not the direction I wanted to go. He he poured and poured over all these historic documents, um, and what he found is that professional tradespeople were here from the from the outset of European settlement. Um, so there were they they had they had joiners, they had carpenters, they had, they had blacksmiths. Um, some of the hardware I know they were importing from um, England, but they, professional craftspeople, tradespeople uh, were here from the outset. And, um, and that's not to say you don't have, 
you know, it's not for all I know, Thomas Loring also built the house. Um, but I would sus my guess is that he probably did not. Um, it's it's I think it's the same divide we see with the white collar and the blue blue collar today. Um, you know, most people that I'm I'm a weird exception where I'm someone that can, I've walked in both worlds. But most people that I know that work in finance, if they're going to have a house built. They're hiring someone to build it. Uh, they're they're not building it themselves. Um, I know a lot of tradespeople that will build their own house. Um, and they came, but, uh, they came and mowed the lawn. They yeah, can't even barely change a light bulb these days. Yeah, it's it's the bifurcation is it's very real extreme now. Um, so I I did do. I kind of said I, I wouldn't want to do it. Avril Cummings. Did, I take that back. I did do a little digging. I found I found a database that had um, some of the surviving um, documentation from that anything related to builders. You know, actual on the on the vellum with the wax seals and the pen and ink and the whole thing. Um, photograph uploaded onto this database. And I did thumb through some of that um, to see if I could find any information on a builder in the area. And what you find is most of the back to the whole, you know, marginalized. It's one, you had slaves and slaves are marginalized and slaves are were doing a lot of the building. Um, but even even free, free men that were tradespeople are, are getting completely, completely forgotten about. Most of those documents that survive, as you would as you might expect, are um, it's it's court papers, for, which are the same. It's, history doesn't repeat itself. It tends to rhyme. The same stuff's going on today. It's court documents that, you know, so and so was supposed to build this addition to the house and they didn't or so and so, you know, the builder brought all these materials and didn't get paid for it. And. So it's most of the surviving documents related to builders is these kind of you know legal disputes, uh, which of course very much still happens with every big building project um, today. But still, you're you're left with the real absence of, you know, the names of these people who you know who who were these builders, and, and there's just not there's there's not a lot. Of that. So I never found out Thomas Loring. Um, I don't. There's not a lot on Loring either. Um, there's actually even some speculate. He owned two properties. Um, there's some speculation that his son might have lived in, in this house and he might have lived in another farmhouse. Um, I went with the information I had, which is it was Thomas Loring was there. I, I found where he's buried. Um, one option you can do if you really want to get crazy is do dendrochronology. So have someone that studies wood come take a core sample, a few core samples out of your beams. Um, and and studied them under a microscope, and they can give you a real accurate date of when the wood was when the tree was felled. Um, I my interest is not. I, I'm not getting that crazy about that. It's it's early it's early 1700s, and the Lawrence the Lawrence had it built. Um, but I don't. I know his his ancestors uh, were high up, you know, officers in the Revolutionary War. I I just get the feeling that these were were white collar people that they weren't building the house. What is um? Th this is kind of a bit. How many houses are like this still existing in New England, and what is the status really of new of historic preservation there? And I mean, you mentioned a lot of these very interesting people you meet. Um, your mentor, whose name is escaping me, but many other people like that, and particularly yeah. the interesting chapters when you go out to Nantucket, yeah, and, and learn learn some tools of the trade. Um, but you also mentioned that some of these materials are kind of very hard to find, that it's not very easy to get the materials that would have been used um, ubiquitously in the 18th century. I guess my question is, what is the status of historic preservation and how um, how arduous is it to kind of do what you did? I mean, it seems very arduous from the book, but if someone else say I wanted to do what you did, would you encourage them? I guess is the yeah. question. I guess you would, but with the yeah the, the so it's it's like anything um, where there are higher concentrations of old houses and where there are high concentrations of, of old old houses, there just tends to be more interest in 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 preservation because now you've got generations of people that you know have grown up where they're taken to the museums as a kid and they're told the history and it gets it it gets in it's back to the cultural heritage end of it it gets ingrained in our story. Um, where you know, I lived in the Midwest for a long time, you go out there and the oldest house you're going to see is there's, there's not that there's very little, there's some, but not a ton of interest in historic preservation out there. Um, the oldest buildings you're seeing are, are late 1800s. 
you know, most of this, most of the stuff you're seeing, it's, you know, the, the baby boom after the war. Um, so it, it's, there certainly is more interest to the further east you go because there's a higher concentration of old houses. Um, I think Nantucket has the claim of the most pre-Civil War, uh, most pre-Civil War architect concentration of, of architecture in the country. Marblehead, Massachusetts, there's, there are a lot of, of 17th and 18th century houses, Ipswich, Massachusetts. Um, but even that being said, for whatever reason, there's just seemed to be more uh, of an interest. And I I have a, a sneaking suspicion it corresponded with the bicentennial back in, in um, 76. It seems like the 70s and 80s, there was just more interest in this stuff. Um, you, you, I've talked to some, I'm not, I don't collect the antiques, but inevitably you, you, people that just like old stuff, you just run into like-minded folks. Um, and occasionally I talk to some of the antique dealers too, that have, have dealed in furniture, this kind of period furniture. And, and what I've gathered is really the interest, you know, in, in, in antiques of this early period really peaked in the seventies and eighties. And it's been somewhat of a decline with just younger generations. Um, I don't have any data support that to support that. Um, the, the, well, there's a the C is it's a sense and the historic the the there's a relatively new CEO. Um, at his, there's a group called Historic New England, uh, a very accomplished guy named Vince Apollo who took the reins of of Historic New England a couple of years ago, and I chatted with him about it. Apparently, he has he has actually a way to quantify that. There is data out there to um, confirm that suspicion, but. There just seems to be less as as the last few decades have gone on. There seems to be less and less of, of an interest in this with younger younger generations, younger folks. I can say personally, I've done probably I don't know a few. The book launched in April, and I've done at least two dozen in person presentations so far at historic societies, um, libraries, house museums, and the demographic predominantly it's it's it's, I mean, average age, I would say it's, I'm on, I'm in my mid forties and I'm on the younger end. I'd say average age of these events is mid sixties. Um, I rarely, rarely see, you know, a 20 something year old show up to one of these things. And I, you know, who knows, maybe that's just, you're retired, you have more time to go hear the talk of the old house. I don't know. Um, but, but my, my, my sense is that the interest has, has been in decline. And that's another part of the reason I'm, you know, I'm out there doing this. Um, you know, I'm trying to see if I can get younger folks excited about this. Stuff. And I'm sorry, you had a, there was a couple parts to your question. I don't know if I just, I don't um, think I answered. That's all. a good answer. Um, particularly though, there's another very interesting distinction you draw in the book between conservation, restoration, and preservation. So I think of an example like with us would be like the Edgar Allan Poe Cottage. Preserving it would be kind of making sure it obviously looks like it did, but also making sure people know the significance of it, the literary significance, the historic significance, um, et cetera. But talk about that distinction and how that kind of inf how that informed what you did with the house. Yeah, so ine inevitably I ended up doing a little bit of all of it. Um, I, have, I have an interesting point to add on the, on the philosophical end of that. Um, so in, in its in its pure form, so I, I say that I'm a, a preservationist uh, or architectural conservative, I guess, technically, but I say that I'm a preservationist. Inevitably, you know, the nomenclature is always changing and evolving. Anyone that says they're a preservationist is doing some conservation or some restoration. So in its pure form, you know, we think about this with environmental conservation, too. You've got, you know, here's this patch of untouched old growth forest. Um, you know, the pure preservation is not doing anything to it. You're saying, we're just going to let this thing take its course. We're going to let Mother Nature work it out. I'm not doing anything. Um, conservation, so I, you know, you see that term used more with people that restore these old paintings. Uh, or you've got all these protesters now that are going into the art museums and taking, you know, a can of tomato soup and splattering all over the Rembrandt or whatever the heck to draw attention to whatever issue. I won't get into that, but. Um, you know, so, some conservators got to come along and kind of clean this thing up. So now you're in in a in a if you're purely a preservationist, you say, well, that's the history of the painting, so we're going to leave it covered in tomato soup. <laughs> um, 
if you're a conservationist, you're going to say, no, we want to we want to show this painting you know, kind of close to how it was displayed when it was first painted. Um, so we're going to clean the soup off, but we're going to do this in a way that is minimally invasive to the paint and the canvas and try to keep as much of this thing intact as it was originally made. So that would be conservation work. Um, and then restoration work is literally we're going to, you know, we're going to get this thing and re restore it completely to how it was. We're going to put all new stuff in and replace what was there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so inevitably I'm doing a little bit of all of it. So there are some things where I will, I'll just leave them on. I referenced there's a house in Charleston, South Carolina called the Rhett Aiken house. Um, and they took a really interesting approach with their house museum. When, when um, Charles, I can't remember the name of the Charleston historic society, whoever acquired it, when they acquired it, they took this approach with the interior anyway of just, we're just doing nothing to it, literally stopped in time. So, you know, I walk through a lot of these old house museums and usually they're restored to a certain period. You go down to the Red Aiken Museum and you walk in there and whenever they acquired it, everything stopped in time. So wallpaper's coming off and it is, everything's just kind of paint flaking and it's, it's, it's just literally they stopped it in time. Um, now, inevitably, they're restoring some parts of it. Uh, if the roof is going, you're going to put a new roof on. That would technically be restoration. To be a preservationist, you have to do some restoration work. Otherwise, the water's going to get in and it's it, you're going to lose your structure entirely. Um, so in, inevitably, you know, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of all of that. Historic New England has a really interesting philosophy. So I remember um, talking to folks there when I was ready to rip out the panel. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of tearing out the old linoleum, ripping out the shag carpeting and tearing out the paneling. Their philosophy is that that's part of the evolution. A true preservationist would leave that alone because that's part of the, that building fabric is part of the evolution of the house that tells the story of that period in time. So if everyone tears out the shag carpet in the 70s paneling, well, there comes a time where we don't have any more of that. And academically, there's no record of what was happening in the 60s and 70s from a building standpoint. So they, with their historic properties, um, frown on this idea of restoring it to a particular period. Let's bring it all back to, you know, 1702. Uh, and you go to some of their properties and you'll see, you know, things from much later periods preserved. Um, I stewed long and hard about that thought and then ultimately went a different direction, still tore out the 70s panel. Uh, but it certainly made me think a lot more about it. So, you, you know, you can kind of, this is where it gets more philosophical. You can split hairs on what approach you're going to take if you're a steward of one of these buildings and, and why you're going to take it. And you can come up with all sorts of reasons. It's interesting that the New York, a lot of the New York houses, um, the, yeah. interior, the interiors are, I mean, they're, they're furnished in the period and so on, but the interiors usually are not. So like enough has changed that they're not, you, you don't have to go through the landmarks commission. In other words, you can do certain things you cannot do to the exterior. Is that usually uh, there's a lot of different government apparatuses you have to go through if you want to do any major work on it. Um, it's true to an extent to the interior, but even then they have this the distinction between something that's has changed hands enough and been changed over time you can try to get as best you can what it looked like in the period you want to reflect but there is that kind of evolutionary component to it as well yeah well on that you know nantucket again having i think the most pre-civil war houses in the country there because they're the museum house is just a little different um if you don't put an easement on one of these properties it's just a residential house and the homeowner can do with what they want yes that's um, true so, so, so they're they're good about you know that the the outside you can't paint the thing in you know hot neon Barbie hot pink or whatever, um, but the the interiors of these things in many cases have long been gutted all you know all the old plaster, yeah. um, most of the original fabric's gone, um, and and it's like anything though I twenty years ago I wouldn't have even cared about it. I don't care the more I learned about it the more I appreciate it and that's another hope of what the book's trying to do people will know a little bit more maybe they'll appreciate. It. Yeah, definitely. I have, a few, I have a few more questions, but I want to turn it over to the uh, audience here, the Q and A. Um, so Carol asks, "Are you willing to talk at a homeowners association in New York City? We're losing all our historic homes, and would love some insights. Thanks." Am I willing to talk at a meeting? 
Uh, I assume that's what she means, or a, a, some kind of homeowners groups, I suppose. Uh, if it's so in person gets a little trickier with travel. If it's a Zoom call like this, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I'll give the same presentation if you if you like this one. You you talk about this in the book though. You talk about that there's the kind of pressure, particularly with um, maybe less so in New England, but in you know, densely populated urban places like New York City, where um, it's really kind of a housing housing crisis, where people have trouble, have trouble finding places to live and affordable, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, there's that conflict with historic preservation. And, yeah, and there's particularly it's interesting now because the, the mayor Adams has a, uh, I don't know what you would call it, an, an, an initiative I suppose called City of Yes, and they've kind of changed some of the zoning rules. Um, I don't know if it's impacted historic districts, but I have a friend of mine in Queens who said that in Ridgewood, which is a very old section of Queens, a lot of historic districts, that a lot of the changes would kind of affect the old the old quality of the historic districts there. Mm. Uh, well, one, you'll, you'll have to, I, so I am, I will be speaking in person in, in Queens coming up here too. To um, but I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just lost my train of thought. What the question at the top was? Oh, if you would speak to a homeowners association in New York City and the, uh, Carol had said that we're losing all of our historic homes here. Oh um yeah yeah absolutely I thought you had had a had, had a question after that maybe maybe I missed oh I was I was asking more about in the book you talk about the problems of housing supply and how that oh yeah that's what it was okay with, I knew with, there, I knew there was going somewhere with that. yeah so this this was the other thing um I tried to be really careful this is it's the word that didactic i think is where when you kind of get on your high horse and want to lecture people um or you're very a lot of people that i meet in the world of historic preservation very strongly opinionated oh you're gonna tear that oh you can't do that um i might feel that way personally but i i try not to communicate that way you know every, every project everyone has their own reasons time money you know, everyone's got their own reasons for for you know making these decisions with these properties uh, and I, I don't want to be someone just up there wagging my finger, scolding people for, for doing what they're doing, um, you know, sh short of demolishing a, a building um, completely. I, I I try to fight against against those ones. But, uh, you know, I'm not against modern building. I'm not saying everyone needs to approach their restoration projects like this. It's very impractical. I'm not saying we need to go back to building, you know, houses this way. Um Cheaper and faster has been motivating building technology for a long time. Um, you can argue that if you build something that's going to last longer, there's an environmental benefit to that. Uh, the materials that are used that go into the construction um, have more time to replace themselves if we're not just building, demolishing, building, demolishing, kind of that disposable nature of, of, of um, consuming things. Um, but I'm not against modern building. I understand there is affordable housing crisis. There's a time where cheaper and faster makes all the sense in the world. You know, I'm fascinated with this idea of 3D printing homes. You know, they've got this concrete you know, tube that squirts concrete on a track that literally is building a house like a 3D printer. Um, I'm not against that. So that's just fascinating to me. Certainly where we have, you know, issues with where affordable housing is a problem. But what I don't like to see is someone buys a historic, nice historic house on an old lot, just demolish it and build a, build a similar sized house on the same lot, um, you know, if you don't want a historic house, then don't buy a historic house. Go build new, but go build new on a. I'm sure you can find another lot that's going to meet your requirements and build a nice new house somewhere else. Um, but I've seen places. There's a group called Historic Boston Inc. where I've seen Historic New England's doing a nice job. Too. I'm sorry, I'm New England and Massachusetts focused. It's just where I'm based. Oh um, no, it's fine. But. Um, you know, I'm so, some organizations are doing more. Certain England's really good. A certain Boston is really good. Of kind of looking at the social problems of the day, and instead of historic preservation being this kind of stuffy group of, you know, old old folks that just want to tell people what color they can use to paint their house, they're kind of looking at the historic issues and saying, well, where can we fit what we advocate for, saving these things, and and not you know changing them too dramatically, 
with some of with some of the social issues of the day. Um, so historic, uh, uh, historic Boston's a great organization that I've worked on a, on one of their properties, uh, where essentially they bought historic building that would have been slated for demolition in almost any other circumstance. They're a nonprofit. Uh, they're able to raise funding. They restored it. They put a historic easement on it, um, so it it you know no one could come in and gut the thing. And then they broke it up into four units and then resold them as condos. Um, so now they took an old historic house that was sitting there rotting that no one was living in, um, and they put four um, you know lower income families in the thing. And oh by the way, they they preserved it, um, and then they put an easement on it. And it's it's kind of a win win if I think about these two issues, affordable housing and historic preservation, and a way they can come together, that's a great example of kind of mashing the two, two, two together and finding a win-win for everybody. So there, there, are way, there are things like that you can do. Very much so. And it's even, we're very lucky to even have our museums. The Pope Cottage was going to be destroyed. Um, they were widening a road at the turn of the 20th century and it's kind of in the way. So what happens a lot in New York is that they're moved into parks. And sometimes parks have been created expressly for the purpose of having a place um, to, put, to put the historic house. Um, in other cases, it's a, a pre-existing park that's very close to where the house was. Mm. Case in the, of the Valentine Marion house, it was right next to what was a, once a working reservoir and then turned into a park in the 19, late 1920s. Um, but I think we're very kind of sui generis in a lot of ways. We aren't like the rest of the country. We, we, other people don't have that luxury to do. Really. Yeah, here th thinking of Poe, you know, especially when you can tie a building to a, a, a historic figure, a historic significant historic figure or event. Um, so I'm a, I, I told you at the time. I didn't think I mentioned this to anyone that's that's dialed in here, but um, so currently I'm I'm renting the house out so I can run around and do this book tour, and then we'll move back in and get back to work uh, probably at, at the end of the year. Um, so I'm up in Salem, Massachusetts at the moment, which if anyone's been to Salem is known for the the, you know, the witch city. It's known for this, you know, his, history of persecuting these women and, and calling them witches and hanging them and so, and so on and so forth. Um, it, that's, a, that's a great example of this, you know, this historic event happens. Um, it's It becomes part of the history of this place. Uh, people want to move on from it because it's somewhat horrific. It kind of gets buried for a while. Um, you know, merch, merchant shipping rules the day, the first millionaire, not, not, um, in today's dollars, first actual millionaire, um, in this country is, is from Salem and the merchant shipping industry dominates for a long time. And then at that industry dries up. And then by the mid part of the 20th century, the town is, is dying. Um, and there's plans to, you know, start leveling old houses and put in a big shopping mall, some kind of drive-through shopping mall. There's that whole urban renewal push. Uh, and that started, a, half, a big block in this town got completely demolished. And then that project fell flat. And then as time goes on, for anyone that knows anything about Salem, um, you know, that kind of hocus pocus, this kind of interest in the, the witch stuff, this kind of, you know, tying it to the feminist movement. There's all sorts of stuff with that. There's been this huge... Um, renaissance with that history um and now the tourism in this town is just booming if you come here in october you can't find a place to park and if you want to park it's going to be 50 bucks and you're going to be still pretty far outside of town the the t this economy is flourishing and booming because they have these old houses and they have this they're tied to this really interesting story um, that culturally has come back around and if they just demolished all this and the whole town became just a, a big drive through mall, um, that gets lost. And what, what would the future of this town be? I don't know, but it's one of those, when I talk about cultural heritage, it's one of those great examples where the architecture you know, ties this town to this interesting historic event that weirdly has, has had a revival. And this town is thriving because of that. Um, you know, and I think about demolishing a Pope cabin, it's, we, it's, we say it's absurd. Um, now, but that, you know, it's the, these things come back around, but it needs people as stewards throughout the generations that have the, the foresight to say, maybe we should, there's a good story here. Maybe we need to save this and people are going to appreciate it long after we're gone. Um, 
and that's you know we're we're there but again a lot of people don't always see that in the moment very much so the cicero said you don't plant a tree for yourself but for posterity that's there you go yeah um does anyone else have any questions in the q a speak now or forever hold your peace um, so I, I wanted to ask, so what's next with uh, the house? What are you working on now? What are your major projects for the future for? Yeah, so um, so as as I mentioned, I've taken a little break from all of it. Um, so after seven years of just nonstop preservation, I got to a point where I was, the, the, the book stuff, um, I was writing, I was doing the business, running my own business, fixing the house, and writing a book, um, and trying to juggle all of it, which was fun and exciting. Um, but as the, the the book project got more serious and then signed with an agent and then got a publishing deal, um, the responsibility that that took on, I, I started to get to the point where I said, I can't do all of this. I can't do all three things effectively. Um, so uh, currently I'm taking a break from preservation. Um, I'm renting the house out. I'm bouncing around full time doing this stuff, uh, which admittedly, as I'm, I'm not old, old, but I'm getting older and it's been a nice break for my joints, my back and my knees. Um, certainly the timber framing stuff, heaving heavy beams around is, it takes a toll on you. Um, but um, yeah, so when we get back, we're probably going to need a new roof at some point. I was talking to you about that before the call started. But really, I would, it's funny, there are there are little cosmetic things that I'm really excited about to do. I kind of, I ended up getting into major, giant major pro projects that would take months at a time and almost break me as a, as a human being. Um, I'm kind of excited about some little ones. There are things like, you know, there are doors hanging where it's an original door, but the hinge has long since been replaced. But you can see an outline in the pain of what, what the original hinge, you know, the early rot strap hinge. Um, and there's a chapter on that in the book, but there are more of those in the house where I can see and hold it. I'd like to just take a weekend and just take my time and kind of methodically, you know, restore an old antique hinge, rot it myself, or buy an antique hinge, and um, you know, just restore some of the old hardware. Some of the doors I've been able to shave down and get them to close again. We still have doors around square and on alignment that don't close. There are lots of little things like that. I would love to have the time to just um, fix fix some little little more cosmetic stuff. But so hopefully, wow. I'll get back to some of that stuff. Yeah, well, I wish you luck, and thank you for a really wonderful talk. And everyone, yeah, please, please buy his book and keep these beautiful homes alive and keep uh, keeping historic preservation alive. Please come to our museums. Thank you all for coming, and thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Yeah. Really, enjoyed really, it. really enjoyed it. Be well.